Do you give you a very warm welcome in the name of the Lord to this service. And as we come to worship God together, I want to read from his word. First of all, from Exodus chapter 40, the end of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And then after the temple was built, and the Ark of the Covenant was brought in, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Now, my friends, are we in any way inferior to our fathers, inasmuch as we do not have those visible tokens, the cloud of glory manifesting the presence of God? Well, actually, we have something far more wonderful than that. We have the risen Lord Jesus Christ. As Matthew Henry says, in him, the Shekinah, the cloud of glory, took up its rest forever. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And as the writer to the Hebrews says, who being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts. To what? To give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, first reading this evening is from the Old Testament and the book of Psalms and Psalm 22. Psalm 22. We're going to read the first 15 verses. As you will know, this is one of the Messianic Psalms. And as we read it, uh, there are many things here that remind us of our Saviour. What he said and what he suffered. So Psalm 22, reading from verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. 
And God bless to us that reading from his holy word. Our second reading from God's word is taken from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 2, reading from verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been given, freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual <coughs> judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now with Easter one week away and the Lord's table at the close of this service, I want to consider afresh the Lord's death and we'll be looking at one particular aspect. Conscious of our brother will be preaching next Good Friday on the crucifixion of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. But whenever we come to a consideration of the death of Christ nearly 2,000 years ago, there are, I'm sure you will be aware, of some dangers that we need to be aware of. And the first one is this, the danger of over-familiarity. These are such glorious things, such wonderful things. There's always the danger of the sheer wonder and glory of them losing their edge. And we need to pray about that, that God may continually bring the preaching of the gospel, the work of our Saviour to us with fresh power. Secondly, there is the danger of approaching the subject in a purely academic or theological way. That's very important. We need, we need an understanding of the theology of the cross. Otherwise, if false preachers, false teachers come, how would we recognise them? We need to understand the theology of the cross. But not only that. Because there is the risk of a merely sentimental or devotional approach that is devoid of theological or spiritual understanding. 
What we need, my friends, is a balanced approach that has at its heart a true theological understanding of the death of Christ, leading then to a heartfelt response to him. And we certainly need to know that the death of Jesus was a sacrificial death. There at Calvary, he offered himself one sacrifice for sins forever. His death was an atoning death. In other words, we're here this evening because at Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ made atonement for all our sins. We need to know that his death was substitutionary. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. He died in our place and in our stead. And then we need to know that his death at Calvary was propitiatory, which means that at Calvary there, when he suffered and died, he was turning away the wrath of God against our sins and bearing in his own body and soul the punishment for those sins. And last but not least, we need to know the true, the full identity of the person who was crucified at Calvary. And it's this subject that will be the main theme of our thoughts this evening. And you'll find our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 8. I'll read verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. And then Paul says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And it's that statement, that last statement, that we shall be focusing upon this evening. But before I do, we do so, let's put it into context, beginning with Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 1.23. For there Paul had declared that the gospel he preached had at the heart of it a crucified saviour, which was to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But though considered foolishness by some, there was in fact nothing foolish about it. His gospel was pure wisdom, the wisdom of Almighty God. And the message of the gospel is nothing less than a wonderful revelation of God's wisdom. No human mind could ever have conceived such a plan of redemption, that the second person of the Blessed Trinity should take human nature should come into this world and humble himself even to death, even the death of, of the cross, to bear the sins of his people, a great multitude from every nation, tribe and tongue that were, had been given to him before the foundation of the world and been drawn to him in the fullness of time. So such a plan of salvation could only have been conceived and executed by a God of infinite wisdom. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, all this is hidden from the sinner and can only be known when God opens the heart of man and enlightens his mind to understand these things. I wonder if you really realise, my dear friend, if you're here this evening as a true Christian, God has done something remarkable, something miraculous. You are spiritually dead and God has quickened you. You are spiritually blind and he's opened your blind eyes. He's given you a new heart and he's given you spiritual understanding. Without which, without this gift of God, we all remain ignorant. And these things make mean nothing to us. And you know when you witness to people and you bear testimony to the gospel, how for the man in the street, without this enlightening and awakening of God, it's nothing to them. Uh, it, they shrug their shoulders and walk away from it. The very fact that you can understand something of the gospel and appreciate something 
is nothing less than a mighty work of God's grace. And we should be thankful to him. The Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing by Charles Wesley, it contains the line, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity. When the Jews therefore crucified Jesus, they crucified a man. They crucified Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, the Nazarene. They saw no more than that. They saw no further than the man. But, says the apostle Paul here, the person they were crucifying was the Lord, the Lord of glory. And had they known that, they would not have crucified him. Indeed, we could say they would not have dared to utter a word against him or lay a finger upon him. If they had known who it was who was standing before them, they would have actually fallen prostrate on their faces, even as John did, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, as we read in Revelation 1.17. When John saw the risen, glorified Lord Jesus, he fell on his face as one dead. But the Lord Jesus, being full of grace and truth, put out his hand and said, Touch this, if fear not. But his initial impression of the risen, glorified Christ was overwhelming. So then, my dear friends, with all this in mind, I want to consider with you then this description of Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory and the fact it was this blessed person who was crucified. Indeed, we must be careful to note that this title was given to him, given to Christ, not primarily by Paul, but by the Holy Spirit, who moved and inspired the apostle to write these words. Remember how Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit's ministry in John 16, 14. We've already reminded ourselves of it. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And I think we can safely say that we will never begin to appreciate as we should what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary until we begin to grasp and understand who he really was and is and ever will be. So who is he? Who is the Jesus that you believe in, my friends? Who is he? Well, he's a unique person. He's the Lord of glory. He's a unique saviour. In fact, he's the only saviour. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved, we're told in Acts 4. And in addition to that, the Bible tells us that he is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. This Lord of glory is both God and man. Truly God, truly man. But my friends, and here we come to some theology, which is very important, he's not two persons. He has two distinct natures, the divine and the human but they are entirely separate from each other and yet wonderfully are united in the one person. They're not merged. And we see from what Paul says here in verse 8 that he regarded Jesus, even in the days of his flesh, as the Lord of glory. The theologian B.B. Warfield, he said, The Lord to whom glory belongs has his native right. Commentator Albert Barnes, he says this statement is a Hebraism, that is a Hebrew idiom, which is the use of words peculiar to a particular language and means the glorious Lord. Another famous commentator, Charles Hodge, he said, we see that the person of Christ may be designated from his divine nature when what is affirmed of him is true of his human nature. So when they crucified Christ, they crucified the Lord of glory. We have a similar kind of statement in Acts 20, 28, where Paul speaks of God 
purchasing the church with what? With what? With his own blood. Now God is the spirit, without body, without blood. But in the person of Jesus Christ, there is a union of the human and the divine. Again, he's one person, but has two distinct and separate natures. God cannot bleed. God cannot die. But in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory bleeds and the Lord of glory dies. He was crucified and God purchased the church with his own blood. In other words, the person they blindfolded and beat was the glorious Lord, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. The person Pilate ordered to be scourged was the Lord of glory. When they spat in the face of Jesus, they were spitting in the face of God Almighty. When they were mocking the person of Jesus, they were mocking God Almighty. The person they nailed to the cross is the same person who created the world, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He's the Lord of glory. But at Calvary, we see the man, Jesus, crucified, suffering and dying. But the person who was crucified was, is and ever will be the Lord of glory, worshipped by all the holy angels. Those who came and ministered to him in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan. Now the importance of this teaching that Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory becomes more apparent when we begin to pose and answer some difficult questions which may or may not have occurred to you. And here's the first one. How is it that the sufferings and death of one person, one man, can atone for the sins of millions of people and therefore billions of sins? There's only one answer. Only when that person is the Lord of glory. In other words, the sacrifice for sin that Jesus offered when he died on the cross is of infinite value and merit because of who he is. God manifest in the flesh, the Lord of glory. Here's another question. How is it that the sufferings of Christ for a limited time on the cross, we're told he hung on the cross for six hours. How can that atone for a multitude of sins, all deserving of everlasting punishment? Now we know there are some people over the centuries, over the years, in our present day, who deny everlasting punishment. It's a very solemn doctrine, isn't it? Let's make no mistake about that. There will be a day of judgment. There is a heaven. There is a hell. And every unbelieving, impenitent person on that day of judgment will be condemned and cast away into hell and into everlasting punishment. A very awful thing to contemplate. So how can the sufferings of Christ for just six hours on the cross 
atone for a multitude of sins, all deserving of everlasting punishment? My friends, the answer is only because the person who suffered was the Lord of glory, the majesty of the person who suffered, the majesty of the Son of God, who was bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. That's what gave infinite value to his sacrifice. Because of who he is, the glorious Lord, his suffering for six hours on the cross is fully accepted by divine justice as a full and fitting atonement for sins deserving of eternal suffering. Another question, how, how can we then rightly evaluate the shame and humiliation of his crucifixion? For he said himself, he hid not his face from shame and spitting when he was brought into the dust of death. My friends, only when we realise that Jesus was and is the Lord of glory. And yet he was willing for your sakes, for my sake, to humble himself to such a degree, to suffer shame and spitting. You know, to feel ashamed is a very unpleasant feeling, isn't it? We've all experienced feelings of shame. We've done something wrong. It's been exposed. It may have become public. Oh, how uncomfortable we feel. Perhaps you blush if you're given to blushing. It's a horrible, a terrible feeling. Well, think about this. All the sins you've committed, shameful things, you will never be brought to shame on account of them. Why? Because your Saviour hid not his face from shame and spitting and bore the punishment of your sins in his own body on the tree. To which we say, amazing love. Amazing grace that thou, my God, should die for me. My friends, do you remember when Pilate <clears throat> brought out Jesus to the people? He said, Behold the man. Alas, the only person he saw, the only person they saw was Jesus of Nazarene. So they had him crucified. My friends, again, when you are confronted with Jesus, Jesus Christ, who do you see? Who is it that you believe in? Jesus the Nazarene? Yes, of course. Jesus the carpenter's son? Yes, of course. Jesus the son of Mary? Yes, of course. But have you seen more than that? Have you seen the glory of this person? Have you seen them, his majesty and glory? Have you recognised him for who he really is? You see, if you do not recognise him now, the day will come when it will be too late to be saved. When our Lord Jesus Christ returns in great power and glory to usher in the day of judgment, and we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and he will make that division between the believers and the unbelievers, the sheep and the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and say to them, Come, beloved of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the earth. But to the goats, to the impenitent, the unbelieving, he will say, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. How solemn that is, that all those people on that day will recognise him as the Lord of glory and the Son of God, but it will be too late. Now is the day of grace. Now is the time of opportunity. That's why this is the most blessed place to be this evening. A most blessed place to be, under the sound of the gospel, 
hearing the preaching about Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Now is the opportunity. And if you're willing, you may come. If you've come a thousand times, you may come again. And be welcome. And if you've never come before, you may come for the first time and be welcome to this Saviour. If you feel your need of him. Why, why are so many churches so empty? Well, because the people round about us have got no sense of sin. They've got no conviction of sin. If they had any any idea of their sinfulness in the sight of a holy God and their danger. Oh, how they would suddenly quickly want to find out about these things. But they don't know these things. And unless God convict them and awaken them, they cannot know these things. But if God has convicted you and made you to feel your need of a saviour, how wonderful that is, what a privilege it is. To feel your need of him. But you know, here's something else very wonderful. Do you remember how the Pharisees grumbled about him and against him? And they said, this man, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Isn't that wonderful? My dear friends, here's the Lord of glory and he's sitting down and he's eating and drinking with sinners, with harlots, with tax collectors, the crooked and notorious tax collectors of the Lord's day. But they've heard about him. They've now convicted of their sin and they're coming and they want to listen to him and he's happy to sit down with them. He's happy to eat with them. Did you ever hear of the Queen of England inviting people to her table? The criminals, the cheats, the violent people. Did you ever hear that? You would never heard it. You never heard of the kings doing that, I don't think. But here's the Lord of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of glory. lords. Where is he to be found? Always to be found eating and drinking with needy sinners. It's wonderful, isn't it? So do you realise, do we all realise that we may have dealings with this glorious person? If not already, then now. You see, though he's so high and lofty, beyond anything we can conceive of in one sense, he says, I am meek. I'm meek and lowly of heart. This is the wonder of the incarnation. The Lord of glory in his human nature. He says, I'm meek and lowly of heart. And I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. I've not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners to repentance. <coughs> Have you heard his voice? Have you heard the voice of the Son of God calling you to repentance? In the book of Revelation, and the last letter to the churches, the seven churches, the church at Laodicea, Laodicea, the Lord Jesus had so many, many solemn things to say about that church. But then he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, here we have it again, and him with me. I will come in and dine with him. I'll have dealings with him. So my friends, have you opened the door? Have you opened the door to this gracious saviour? Have you opened your door, the door of your heart, that you might receive him? I hope you've done it a thousand times, probably. Or do it again. And if you've never done it, we'll do it now. This day of grace and this day of opportunity. Because if you open the door, he will come in. And then, my friends, when he comes in, what a feast you will have. The forgiveness of all your sins in a moment, in an instant. The first time 
we ever believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified by faith. All our sins are forgiven and pardoned in an instant of time. The gift of eternal life. The gift of a perfect righteousness. The righteousness of God, which is by faith. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Immediate adoption into the family of God. And the Spirit of God coming to dwell in our hearts. By whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit of adoption. My friends, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is God's indescribable gift. And as the hymn writer has said, those who receive him receive all other gifts in one. That's Horatius Bonar. He says, blessed be God, our God, who gave for us his well-beloved Son, the gift of gifts, all other gifts in one. Blessed be God our God. So surely we can say, whoever has God for his portion has everything, doesn't he? If God is your God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, if he is your God and your Saviour, your Father, your Comforter, you have everything. Never envy the sinner. Never envy the riches of the sinner because you are indescribably rich. If you're a Christian, you possess the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry soul with good things. So my friends, let us all afresh this evening behold the man and as we do, behold in him the Lord of glory, the incarnate Son of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 4 and verse 3, we find the Apostle Paul referring to the gospel as the gospel of the glory of Christ. The gospel that we love. The gospel we love and preach is the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's a revelation of his glory from beginning to end. See then, see in him the glorious Lord in his birth, in his incarnation, in his life and death and resurrection and ascension to the right hand of God. See him with the eye of faith and receive him as your Lord and Saviour. Oh, may the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness shine in all our hearts. To what end? To give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Amen.